we've given our lives, a part of our lives to this place. And uh, so I have, uh, would like to kind of recognize and honor um, people who passed away who were affiliated to the department. Um, uh, Jim Cronin passed away almost a year ago. Uh, uh, Jim was a Nobel laureate in, um, in physics. Ben. Yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you. And the, um, uh, he, he was the person next door when I first arrived. And, uh, another, uh, another Nobel laureate, Alexei Burkosov, was uh, a friend of the department. Um, I had a really nice talk with Oleg about his really interesting family history, and I urge you to, <laughs> to share that with whoever. Uh, um, and uh, he passed away in the spring. Um, too young, uh, Sawyer Gordon, who was a student um, in uh, our department studying physics and electrical engineering, um, passed away in the summer. Uh, Miko uh, Kohotek uh, also um, passed away in the spring. His family has established a scholarship in his honor, and I urge you to talk to Catherine should um, you wish to uh, contribute to that scholarship. Um, sorry, this is the hard one, because we're here, we lost Ziggy. Uh, and I'm really happy that Adam will give a presentation, um, a demonstration that is of Ziggy's design. And I am sure it is not OSHA compliant, whatever it is. <laughs> well, I'm not positive. <laughs> um, okay, this is, this is the exception to prove the rule. So, um, and today we learned that Haven uh, Bergeson, um, who is a, a really, I've, I've heard, um, a really sweet person who is the the chair of, um, of our department um, uh, passed away last week. So. I'm gonna move on to uh, uh, research for us. Thank you for, for um, people who contributed the, their uh, sort of research accomplishments and other accomplishments. Um, I'll run through these, but before I do, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that the department uh, held and Basically, we all contributed to a really successful research symposium in the spring. That was a huge amount of fun, and I think that um, we should all be ready to do it again in the spring. Um, that was, that was a, a great time. We got to um, see what our, our colleagues and their students are doing for research, and I urge you to really kick it out. Um, who knows, maybe the, that chair might ramp up the prize offerings. <laughs> So um, I have somewhat dense slides um, here for you, but I did want to um, just co go through some of the, the highlights of people's uh, year in terms of research. Um, Kyle Dawson, who's the instrumentation scientist for um, EBOS, um, one of the, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, projects, um, completed a cosmological sample, um, basically looked at quasars um, in, uh, to map out the large scale structure of the universe. And he picked up the, um, the basically sound echo imprinted in the galaxy distribution um, using this sample. That's one of the key cosmological measurements of the um, EBOS experiment. Um, Clayton developed a fiber optic based 3D interferometer for machining and robotic applications. Man, I have heard about this and I really want to see what he's got going. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about it. Um, and uh, see Carlton, uh, has been working on uh, uh, Lattice QCD, a very computer, literally a computer intensive project. And his collaboration was uh, recently um, given uh, uh, al huge allocations um, and resources to um, study of, uh, fundamental particle, uh, f fundamental physics using uh, supercomputers as a result of um, uh, the Department of Energy uh, project. And Vikram, I'm happy to announce your, um, or just to congratulate you on the ACS Petroleum Research Fund New Research Investigator Award. Dima, I'm gonna have to read this. Um, Dima built with the students a geometric theory of natural optical activity in metals and discovered a new disorder-induced contribution to orbital magnetization in solids along the way. I would love to talk and learn more about what that actually means. <laughs> so. Next week you will hear that. Excellent, yes, good, good. I, I was gonna look and see if you were on the schedule. So, great. 
Um, uh, John reported that the telescope array surface detector has observed a downward counterpart to the terrestrial gamma flash phenomenon until recently only seen by Earth orbiting satellites. Downward, we're talking lightning. This is very cool. Congratulations. So, and the Cosmic Ray Group um, reports that the telescope array is continuing to see a hot spot in the gamma ray flux at very high energies in the sky and was awarded this year um, approval for the TA times four um, extension to the experiment involving a gargantuan amount of desert. <laughs> um, Zheng uh, said that one of the highlights of his year um, was to organize the um, very successful Snowbird Cosmic Climate Alpha workshop, which has the extraordinary name Snowclaw. <laughs> and um, uh, Oleg uh, notes that his student, uh, Wen Jin, is to defend her thesis in just a few days, and she's already found a postdoc position. Has she defended yet? Awesome. I, <laughs> congratulations to you and her. Um, Pearl and uh, Paolo uh, were awarded funding to the NSF. For, uh, to, study the dark matter, to study dark matter and new physics. Um, their, their proposal was um, uh, jointly awarded 30% increase over their um, combined um, NSF commitment from the past. And Pearl Sandek is now the chair of the National Organization, um, Organizing Committee for the APS Conferences um, for Undergraduate Women, um, known as QWIP. The conference takes place um, in um, January, uh, about 2,000 students in uh, 12 sites in North America. Joel uh, Brownstein reports uh, uh, or uh, cites Utah membership in the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, Next Generation. I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, the discovery also of new gravitational lenses, lens candidates working with his PhD student, Michael Talbot, um, uh, observed in nearby galaxies. Um, Dan um, Week uh, cites a, a data analysis um, grant that he was awarded. Um, and also that he received the NASA Exceptional Public Achievement Medal, an actual medal for his, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's that big. <laughs> um, and it's for his uh, uh, dress astronomer uniform. I wish he hadn't have let everybody know that. So we're, we'll have to show up in ours in next, next year's colloquium. Okay, for his work on the new star uh, uh, experiment. And then Christoph. Um, demonstration of spin collectivity within a monolithic thin film based organic light emitting diode OLED radio frequency microwire device was one uh, piece of, of, of work that you, you reported as a, and the second was quantitative inverse spin hall effect detection by a precise control of the driving field amplitude. Are you giving an undergraduate seminar? I think I should. Yes, <laughs> please do. <laughs> then I will understand uh, what, what uh, um, your work. Anil uh, reports that his student, uh, Jun Nguyen, recently had a, a 20 hour ALMA proposal approved. Uh, ALMA is an amazing experiment in the um, uh, Chilean mountains. Um, it's a very, very competitive um, uh, to get time on, on ALMA. Uh, it's a, a, a design to search for black holes in seven uh, nearby low mass galaxies. Um, and Gail, your personal milestone. Um, would be uh, to start here at the U and, and you're actively seeking graduate students, actively seeking graduate students with interest in the very timely and energizing fields, energized fields of stellar physics and galactic chemodynamics. Um, and Valley, an extraordinarily productive summer is what I heard. And this is just a rumor. So I hope um, you don't mind. You didn't submit this formally, but this is, this is a, a great record. This is just a, a sampling of your publications. These are the high-end ones um, from, uh, high-end journal ones from the summer uh, with a number of different people, including Sarah's group and Shanti's group here, um, also in collaboration with chemistry and um, the College of Engineering. So uh, congrats on a very productive summer. And uh, we look forward to your colloquium, special colloquium that Valley will give. See you here or somewhere on <laughs> October 26. So congratulations. Thank you, everybody, for, for your help. <laughs> you know, um, our work tends to reside just um, within our own scientific communities. But every now and again, um, our work gets launched out, out to gain um, exposure and to inspire um, people within the general public. 
And I just reported just a, a handful of things, some already mentioned, um, that received uh, uh, media coverage um, over the past year. Valley and Sarah um, have uh, discovered a material, identified a material um, that is very, very well suited to um, control of electron spin as a carrier of information. And the, the uh, tricky thing with this material is also able to sustain the spins for um, uh, longer periods of time than in other, other materials, making um, the possibility of actual devices using spintronics um, closer to us um, uh, now. Um, the panel on the right is uh, Kyle's work uh, using quasars uh, to uh, measure the large scale structure of the universe um, and identify the baryon acoustic um, uh, oscillation, the, the echo of, of sound waves in the primordial universe is imprinted on the galaxy distribution. Um, John's uh, lightning uh, identification with uh, gamma ray bursts um, received coverage as well. Shanti's group uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, lithium under pressure and identified um, uh, quantum uh, crystal behaviors in this material, high pressure um, uh, experiment with diamond anvils. And the last panel on the right, is lower right, is Anil's um, uh, hunt for supermassive black holes in galaxies which are way too small to host such things. And, and yet they do. Community engagement. For a department of, of our size, for what we do, we have an extraordinary um, outreach um, organization. I list the programs here and the people associated with our outreach efforts. And uh, it really is uh, amazing. And I'm really grateful to the people who've put their time and energy um, into uh, getting science out into uh, the school system and inspiring people um, to, to continue on with science and just educating the general public about science. Um, and I urge you to contact anyone on the list or me if you wish to contribute to our outreach effort. Um, but really, thank you for everybody who's contributed. The people who've done the, um, the mentoring of, of REU and ACCESS students, uh, people who've gone out and presented into K through 12 classes, um, and done movie nights at the, the, um, the library, natural history events, science fair judging, and that sort of thing. The bottom line is that we reach about 70,000 people directly um, per year, um, just as our department. Tino, um, at, uh, who's, who runs the, the refuges program out of the, the um, the Center for uh, Science and Math Education, CSME. And the program is designed to help students, high school students in our, um, our refugee community um, bridge uh, into uh, the University of Utah. And this is a really incredible program. It's uh, uh, extremely successful and I urge you to go into KSL and, and watch. It's uh, uh, really an inspiring um, story. So uh, Tino, um, if you're here, I uh, thank you. Yeah. And it's, I think, really appropriate that our PR person, Catherine, was actually on NPR. <laughs> and Catherine was interviewed um, by All Things Considered during the Partial Eclipse event um, here on campus. And uh, I mean, that's, that's really cool. So uh, congrats on that and thanks. Um, Science Friday. I've always wanted to be on Science Friday. Pearl, <laughs> this is great. Um, Pearl had a, uh, was part of a story on particles behaving badly, which I have to immediately say is about um, some uh, unexpected uh, particle detector uh, um, results that have been um, used to motivate um, new physics. Is that fair to say, roughly? I should, um, I'll be corrected in the next incarnation because you're working with the Science Friday um, a crew on the next. Uh, um, uh, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> that, that's great. Anyway, congratulations. That's very cool. Okay, we get to the part about sustainability. This is a kind of a weird term, but really 
what it means is how are we going to maintain our department going forward? How are we going to respond to changes in the, in the, um, the student population, the changes in, in the research landscape? Um, you know, basically all the things that we have to manage um, as an entity to, and still provide the things that uh, we do. So this is my snapshot, which I'll kind of gloss over, um, just kind of describing you know, our scope and our scope within the university. You know, we teach 2,500 students per semester. Um, we have a few hundred uh, undergraduate majors, roughly 100 graduate students. Um, I list uh, uh, the numbers there. One thing to note is that as uh, compared to other Pac-12 institutions, we rank eighth. So we are not huge. We're actually a, a middling size department compared to other institutions, um, even in, just in the Pac-12. Number of faculty, we're low, yeah, we're number. That's, that's the eighth the number of faculty. Eighth, thank you, yeah. The, that number is based on the, the faculty headcount. Um, and you know, we're compared, we're, our sister institutions include University of Colorado um, and University of Arizona, which have far bigger um, uh, programs than, than we do in physics and astronomy. So um, we can expect to grow. Our enrollment um, in the University of Utah is growing too. I do not know the numbers. If anybody's heard what the numbers are for the size of the incoming freshman class, please let me know. The ones I heard were 15%, but I know I, three of my kids have been freshmen. They, yeah. Um, those numbers won't settle out until um, the freshman class is, is fully enrolled. So I haven't heard anything. If anybody has, um, we were expecting at most 15%, but, um, and I heard we were sort of on our way toward there. That's an enormous influx of students, and our department will respond. The university as a whole will have more resources, so we will grow as well. Um, our job in the process of that growth is to um, set our vision, define our goals. The resources will follow to us to uh, meet the goals um, that we have set for her ourselves. Um, this year, as uh, um, serving as chair, I've seen that uh, the administration will, uh, uh, will basically respond to our um, desire for specific things. If we have a clear vision of what we want, um, upper administration can help. Um, we have seen, as I'll, I'll point out in, a, in a, the next couple slides, um, specific effort by um, the university to help the science mission of our department. Um, we've, um, we're working on making our, our salary structure fair and competitive. Um, the university is providing us more resources for our education mission and LA program, meaning learning assistant uh, program, um, which I won't describe today. We're also getting resources to really change out our physics one and two um, classroom labs. Importantly for our discussion is that the upper administration has also um, been supportive of new faculty lines for our department to grow. Okay. This is um, one thing that the university supported. Utah is now an institutional member of AS4, which is the uh, precursor to the next generation Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And uh, two of ours, Gail and Joel, are um, on the management council of uh, Sloan. And as, as mentioned, Gail is the spokesperson. It's the shift button, it doesn't work. The um, upper administration has given us approval um, to uh, not only continue with our biophysics uh, uh, faculty search as part of the trans, um, uh, transformative excellence program, but uh, to hire two high energy uh, theorists. And we start this year under the search leadership of, of Pearl Sandek. So let's um, look forward to, uh, to that and, and uh, uh, meeting some excellent potential candidates. Uh, we also have a potential for pushing forward um, in the transformative excellence program into uh, data science and astronomy as well. Now, one thing that happened when, uh, in the fall uh, that subjected uh, me and Christoph and Jordan to a number of meetings uh, was that the College of Science decided to look at its um, uh, physical layout in terms of the of the buildings, essentially, and the uh, people who um, occupy those buildings for work. And they did a, a relatively extensive um, uh, study uh, called the Strategic Facilities Plan. And uh, I, 
the, the process of going through this, I think, was great for all of us. We began to look at ourselves. We looked at um, uh, the types of work, the type of work that we do, the, the um, needs in terms of the resources to get that work done, and what kind of work we want to do in the future going forward. So the, um, the other component of, of this study was to understand how the physical structures could uh, help us or hinder us in this process. So we uh, put forward slides like this one. We submitted to the consultants who ran the study. This slide just is it's a snapshot from something that we submitted. Um, it talks about faculty, the number of students we've got in the faculty. Um, it talks about the types of research we might be doing. But it also talks about um, the quality of the space and the, the amount of space that we have. Um, I heard when I first stepped into the role of chair last year, a resounding um, statement that we need a new building. We need new facilities um, to be more effective going forward. So just to um, emphasize that I put these big arrows there. Um, one thing that we did when we were giving the consultants tours of our facilities, especially this building, we kept on pointing out sort of the, the things we didn't like that seemed old, the, the parts of this building, that to try and give them the picture that we really could benefit from um, new facilities. And basically the architects or the consultants who were architects told us, um, you know, we're architects. We know you need a new building. <laughs> and <laughs> so this is the result of the study. Um, it describes some of the space, the, the infrastructure needs of the, um, of the uh, of, uh, entities in the College of Science, the departments. Um, I took a snapshot of this from a document that Christoph saved. That's why it's so ratty. I was so excited. I just like pulled out my phone and took this picture. Um, biology. Uh, evidently needs to balance some initial focus on some existing space. Mm. Uh, chemistry needs to continue plans for some building addition. Um, math needs to renovate some one building and really kind of ramp up a new loft area. Physics and astronomy. Abandon plans to renovate. <laughs> Design new space. <laughs> so. So um, anyway, we <laughs> this, this is, so the university got the message. But it's really, really important, since these are long-term plans, for us to keep pushing forward and doing what we can do best with what we've got and uh, um, the resources that we have. So we continue to renovate. We're um, uh, in the process of redesigning, revamping our introductory physics labs that are currently housed in South Physics. Some of those labs will be moving to Crocker Science Center. Others of those labs will be moving to the first floor of uh, JFB, this, this building. Um, there's a significant shuffle of lab space involving um, all three buildings. Um, we're working on a plan uh, to make uh, our facilities generally more parent friendly. And we've also taken the goodwill and actually kind of self-serving effort um, or step of uh, sheltering facilities management district uh, personnel in the first floor of our building, which has actually worked out quite well since uh, when things break, they get fixed immediately. Um, <laughs> the uh, the goal, I'm sorry? What does parent friendliness mean? Oh, we're a, a room where if, if um, someone needs to, a uh, lactation station, for example. Oh. Uh, parents of the students in our lab. Oh, <laughs> kind of what it seems like. yeah, it could be. You're right. Good point. I, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, parents send them my way. The, yeah. That's, um, the, the goal of all this is to provide better lab space and better connections between people in the labs and to move people out of windowless offices. So um, they'll be more soon instead of coming soon, but more soon. And I really appreciate and um, I uh, am grateful to the hardship that this imposes on um, those affected by these changes. And it's with apologies and, and um, with gratitude that uh, we, we uh, push forward. Now, um, last year, thinking less of our buildings, but more about what we do here, I created this um, Wordle diagram, which looked like this. I asked for abstracts of um, all the faculty members um, uh, and uh, basically a year ago, and combine those abstracts and the, there's a, a JavaScript that, or Java code that um, organizes the text of the abstracts and, and highlights the words 
that um, are, appear most often. And you can see, I get a sense of kind of what we do. Well, um, having basically run out of time, a solar eclipse in totality and other things, I, um, uh, through lack of any imagination, did the same thing when um, I asked for what are the important questions um, in your research area. And I think it's really cool that you can uh, kind of glean um, what matters, the question is important. Yeah, I'm not getting a whole lot of it, but it's really quite, quite beautiful. So um, to try and bring this back to a quantitative reality, um, I also requested that people provide um, titles and, um, and uh, project summaries of recent grant proposals. And here's what we got. Here you can see kind of where um, the proposals are going. Uh, properties is important. Uh, things matter, evidently. <laughs> and proposal is in there, new is pretty big, and there's also. I mean, it's kind of actually psychologically interesting to see what people, uh, what words people use in proposals. In fact, I may, no, I won't go any further with this one. So trying to do something quantitative, I thought that maybe since I had a baseline of topics um, from abstracts um, um, last year, I could somehow merge um, the, uh, what kinds of things we were doing um, with the kinds of things we will be doing and create some sort of derivative, some sort of gradient of, um, of research. And so I did some image subtraction and this is what I got. So in the end, all I was able to do was decide that maybe image subtraction and trying to determine where we're going through this method was less appropriate and certainly less um, aesthetic than maybe just um, adding them together. I think this is quite beautiful. So um, I'm going to um, close the formal part of this talk here. Um, I, I have this, this slide, uh, space-time continuum. We do have rundown space. Um, we are crushed for time, but we remain a, a, a vibrant and a dynamic department. We've been working together, uncovering the mysteries of the universe, discovering new materials, pathways, and cures to make our planet a better place and to inspire the next generation of scientists. But really, the theme of this is thank you um, for, um, uh, for, for being here. I really hope you have a, um, a great and um, a productive year this year and let me know if I can help in any way. So thank you for coming today and if you want I do have um, a couple of outtake slides to show you um, and we've got Adam who will give a, a demonstration um, that was uh, designed by Ziggy. So anyway thank you very much. Um, okay so these are the people who will help you as a graduate um, student population here. And if you notice in this, this slide, they all overlap. It's like this one is on top of this one, is on top of this one, is on top of this one. See, it's like an Escher painting. Okay, never mind. <laughs> That's really hard to do in PowerPoint. So. Okay, and so we are going forward pushing on plans to improve our space. And this is one of the first steps in improvement of our space. It, <laughs> it's a beautiful building, but it, it really, really lacks some design. I just don't know what to do with it. So I thought maybe we could, we could put a design on it. And I, I put this question mark here to inspire you as to what we might put on this. But then I really like the question mark. <laughs> okay, so we're really going to be pushing forward in our space. We're going to um, uh, really build our, our department out. We're seeking a new building and we start with this wonderful facility. <laughs> this facility here should have a name. It should have a proper name. We, after all, give um, uh, uh, letters, initials to our other buildings. SP for South Physics, JFB is over to the right. I didn't know what to do with this thing. <laughs> anyway, um, I also want to thank everybody for the, um, 
the, the faculty members who talked about the automated cars, I asked this strange question about automated cars, but I think I'm in the interest of time, um, if anybody wants it, the, some of the answers are hysterical, but I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. translated into uh, what it was used for. He uh, was a founding member of PIRA, Physics Instructional Resource Association, that classifies demonstrations for labs and lecture. Uh, they started the organization from scratch. Whatever you want. And he wrote one uh, article in the PIRA news about this uh, demonstration. And the first lines say, demonstrating the fact that scattered light is most intense when the electric field vector is perpendicular to the line of sight is difficult at best. So the point of this is to do that. And now that all of you are like, what was it? That's what I'm going to show you, so it's OK. <laughs> this scatters light. Now if I turn on a laser pointer, it goes through. And you can see the green beam because it bounces off and scatters. The uh, showing the fact that that's most intense, it's brightest when its electric field vector is perpendicular to the line of sight. So if it's coming to you guys in this direction, in a plane like that, then the electric field vector needs to be perpendicular. That's when it'll be brightest as it scatters. So the field vector is scattering to you guys this way. It's vibrating up and down but it travels to you that way in your line of sight. And showing that was, was difficult, and that was the, uh, ingen the, geni the nicety <laughs> of Ziggy doing this demonstration. This is full of Cairo syrup. He had a couple versions of this. Uh, th I like this one the best. So he, he built this. It's a lot, of, a lot of sugar. And the idea here is it all looks e almost equally bright, but as more and more gets scattered, it gets dim. So. I'm going to dim the lights so you can see this better. Mm, let's go to there. If I polarize the light, it's now vertically polarized. So the light's definitely doing this. We've known that Cairo syrup is optically active. It, uh, the electric field that's coming in the uh, electromagnetic radiation causes the molecules in here. I know they don't look like this. This is just to help you visualize. They start vibrating like this, vertically, up, moving the charges. The electron distribution gets polarized. It's like an electron, electric dipole. And so it's like an antenna that's now emitting the waves out in the, in the horizontal plane to it, again, perpendicular. They get here. But because Cairo syrup, the sugar molecules, are optically active, it rotates the, that plane of the electric field vector. So it'll come in like this, the polarized light, and it starts rotating around like that. So when it's here, in this direction, if it's oscillating this way, then it's radiating out in that direction. What would you guys see? Nothing. When it rotates further and it's like this, then you can see it. And so that was his ingenu ingeniousness of this demo. Can you see it? It's not as conspicuous, so I'm going to alternate. The intensity should look brighter in some areas and less intense in others. Not polarized, polarized. Not polarized, polarized. Can you see that in the back? Or should I make it darker? Okay. Let's try that one. This makes it more obvious if you rotate the polarizer and change the direction it starts at. And I like just spinning it freewheeling here. Get out of there. So you can see the intensity sections change because the Cairo syrup rotates it. If you're really clever, and Ziggy came up with this, you take a mirror 
And for me, if I'm looking above it, I can see light right here. This is a bright spot. This is a dark spot. What's it for you? About the opposite, because they're 90 degrees from each other. I know that everybody can't see this at the same time. Tell me when the angle seems about right. Can you see that the light coming from this direction to you is opposite from the light coming from this direction? That was the point of this demo, to demonstrate that the electric field vector is most intense when it's perpendicular to the line of sight. Now, Ziggy uh, and I came up with, it's as fun as that is, it works with white light. This scatters, you see it. You get less and less light scattered out here because it's subtracted from the beam. It's polarized. If you polarize the light that goes into it, the scattered light is partially polarized, and you get what I refer to as an optical barber pole. <laughs> you can do this on the overhead projector vertically, but it's fun horizontally. Ziggy came up with it doing it horizontally. And you rotate this, you can see it change. Just like an optical barber pole. And again, with the mirror, You should see different colors, the complementary colors at 90 degree angles to it. Can you see that okay? I need some feedback in the dark, okay. <laughs> and lastly, I'll just add uh, different wavelengths because of the different frequencies get rotated at different rates. So that's what separates the colors out that will get scattered. Uh, Ziggy designed this. He wrote about it. Uh, Everybody in, in the United States at different universities like immediately started building some of these. It's not the most commonly thing needed to discuss in an intro physics class, but Ziggy gets the credit for this with people around the world to do what I do. And I, I figured I wouldn't make it without getting, I'm done. So before I cry, just thank you, Ziggy. Corn syrup. What? Corn syrup. Cairo syrup. syrup. We've messed with um, different sugar contents, or sugar densities in the water, and nothing seems to rotate it as, as well and as quickly as corn syrup. So it's readily available, cheap, and tastes good. So. <laughs> What's that? Brown sugar. We didn't try brown sugar. What's that? Cairo syrup. Corn syrup. Brown probably wouldn't, it's a little too opaque maybe. But. So, go home. You got a pair of polarized sunglasses? Take two up, two pairs or pop your lenses out. If you sandwich you know, cross polarizers, just take your jar of corn syrup in between them. <laughs> Seriously. So you're like this, just hold it up to the light or shine something through it and you'll see the colors rotate. Try this at home.